for you. Um, last week we ended in verse 19. Uh, of course the great thing about the book of Jude is only one chapter, so you can't really mess it up. So if I say a verse, it's in the first chapter. If I say there's a second chapter, start looking around. See if there's any, 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 any silly juice running around. Um, so this morning what I'd like to do is begin by reading the last five verses of this chapter because we moved to 19, so that's 20 through 25. So I'm going to real quickly read through that, and uh, so as you get a chance to get there, uh, I'll be reading. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some com have compassion, making distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to the present present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So, a wonderful scripture. You've probably heard a bit of that scripture on a, on a sign somewhere. Or, uh, parts of that is a very, very common scripture you've heard. So, uh, it actually is a, one of the most remarkable doxologies uh, some scholars feel in the Bible, particularly the last two verses. Um, and so, uh, like I said, it is a very, very commonly known verse. Um, and in this portion of the book, he gives us one last charge, or directive, if you will. And this directive is this, keep yourselves in the love of God. Uh, and then he says there's three things that can help you do that. And they are building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, and look for his coming. Uh, and those are things that we should do every day. Uh, what we see is these three things are subordinate in the language. Uh, that means they are all in line with the main directive. So if you do these three things that he's given us, you will fulfill the main directive, uh, which is keeping yourselves in the love of God. Uh, now, I don't want you to be confused here. There's a few things the passage doesn't say. It doesn't say this, keep God loving you. Is that possible? I, I don't think so. Does it say keep yourself worthy of his love? I don't think that's possible either. It doesn't say work to deserve his love. Right? It doesn't say any of that. Um, because those are things that we can't do. And what we have to understand is that if you're already born again, and I hope most of us are here this morning are, that we already exist in God's love. So therefore you can't get there. You exist already there. So you're in the sphere, the sphere of his love once you were born again. Um, and the objective to keep yourself there would be pretty, was pretty difficult because you're already in there, right? So the objective, though, is to stay in God's love. That means stay where you are in a relationship that you can communicate with Jesus Christ and your Lord and Savior. Because this is a place of blessing. It's a place of strength. It's a place of renewal. Uh, and we have to always remember, we don't create it. And if we fall off the horse and we sin, then all that does is it doesn't stop God from loving us. It stops the relationship the personal relationship we have with Jesus during that time. And so what we have to do is come back, right? <clears throat> so to stay in his love means we have to stay away from sin in our lives. And when we do, we have to ask for forgiveness, right? And then we can come back to that fellowship. So that's the key here. Jesus talking about the fellowship that we have with God and not to fall away from that. Sin is the thing that separates us in our relationship. Doesn't mean God doesn't love us. Doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. But it does mean when we're living in sin, that we have difficulties fellowshipping with Jesus and our Lord and Savior. So, you see, this is an umbrella type situation. Everybody that is born again is under the umbrella of this, and they are in the fellowship of God, and He will always love you. So, 
he says, keep yourself in the spirit. And uh, to do this, he's given us some really good things to do in our own lives here. Uh, recently, uh, did anybody watch the news and hear uh, the theory of herd immunity? Oh, her, her, herd immunity. Anyone know what that means? <laughs> that, that means that if everybody gets it right, that pretty soon we'll all be immune to it, right? So if you went back to Pastel and a few of these other people that did original research on uh, immunities way back when, they thought that people, if they just all got the disease, that eventually if they just stuck them all in one room, sort of like the chicken pox, right? Mm -hmm. If you stick everybody in the chicken pox, they'll all get it, and then they'll all never get it again, right? So there's this theory out here that, that this could work with the virus even, so in the context of that. Now uh, whether it does, I don't know. I'm no scientist. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, that's a way above my pay grade. Um, but I can tell you this. If we are the kind of Christians who keep themselves in the love of God, building each other up in the faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and expecting the return of Christ, it produces something that is healthy for all believers. I do know that. The more, the, more, the more Christians we have like this that do these things, the more likely and the healthier the congregation is going to be, or the body of believers. And it also does a strange thing. It also encourages and strengthens the weaker ones as well. So the more that we can be like this, it does produce some kind of immunity to falling off. And so this can be said for Christians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ. Then it goes on verse 16 to say this, From whom the whole body fittingly joined it together, and compacted by that which may jointly supply it, according to the effectual working in every measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so what he's saying there is, the more that we do these things, the stronger we are as a body. That's what he says in Ephesians, and that's what he tells us. And so what he's saying here, if we pay attention and we love one another, we have an immunity as a group. Um, and I guess that would be like a spiritual immunology, right? Kind of like a spiritual vaccine, if you will. Um, and so when we look all around us, there's quite a contrast to that, right? There's insanity going all around us, right? Has anybody seen that lately? A little sanity going on around us? If you watch the news, there's a little craziness going on, right? Um, the other thing that's going on around us is, and Joe, Jude talks to this, is there's false teachings going on all around us too as well. People saying things that aren't true. They're saying them in the church. They're saying them in the world. And we have to protect ourselves from those things. Um, you know, when you, when you look around here and you look at, look at the news, can you believe everything that you hear? No, you don't know the truth. I guarantee you that it doesn't matter where the source we get news from or we get information from, it's hard pressed to know if it's really the truth. Because what happens is everybody spins the information to make it look like they want it to, right? So, so you believe what they want you to believe. And that's the difficult part. Uh, it would be nice to get facts that are just facts so we can make our own decisions, but too often not, we don't get that, right? Um, it's skewed in their perspective, and that's what happens. Um, if you look today, you know, uh, out there, you know, the pharmaceuticals are busy making the vaccine, right? And uh, they say, oh, we're doing it for the, for the health of the people. We want them to be better. Do you think they're doing it for that reason? Or do you think they're doing it because they might be millions of dollars? I tend to think maybe they want to make millions of dollars. They, I'm not saying that somebody there doesn't, doesn't want to be a humanitarian at all. But for the first time since World War II, the entire world has evolved in a conflict, the same conflict. Isn't that a situation that if one person could come in and fix, wouldn't everybody bow down to him? Isn't that exact situation in which the Antichrist comes? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying this is the situation in which the Antichrist comes. What I'm saying is a situation like this, right? If somebody could come and fix all the problems, somebody, everybody would be very excited to accept them, right? That's, what, that's how we can see how it can happen in the future. Because things like this. 
Because the Antichrist is going to come in power and the ability to fix and bring peace. So what we see here is in this world, we can see how that could take, a, take effect or the stage could be set today for something in the future. But for us as believers, isn't it wonderful that we have Jesus in the middle of all that? Remarkably, the hope that we have in him? All the things we thought were important before we now realize aren't all that important, right? Maybe your favorite football team won the Super Bowl last year, right? This year, we don't even know if they can finish the season, right? <laughs> is it all that important, right? <clears throat> what really is important today that we can see when we go through all this craziness in the world is eternity that is ahead of us, salvation, our Savior, our God's Word, His Holy Spirit, the fact that we can pray, and no matter how bad it gets around us, we live in the hope that He's going to take us out of here. Can I have an amen? Amen. amen. He's going to take us out of here. That's <clears throat> remarkable. And that's what Jude is saying here in the context. Look, keep yourselves in the love of God, and that's His final direct directive. So the nuts and the bolts is, how do we do that? How do we get there? In verse 20, it says this. But you believe, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So the first thing is, he tells Christians, you're supposed to be builders. <clears throat> now obviously, he has never watched me build a wall before. It wasn't quite right. You know, if you don't get everything square, the roof isn't square, it leans, it's not good. But he calls us to be builders. So I hope spiritually I'm a much better builder spiritually than I am building a physical building. That's what I hope. Um, and when he says building, what's the very first thing we know you have to have if you're going to build a building? Foundation. A good foundation. Exactly. If we don't have a good foundation, we can't build. And what it tells us in the Bible, that when you have a good foundation, that when the winds and the storms come, the house did not move because it was built on a good foundation. Do you all remember that story? Ah. You see, our foundation is Jesus Christ. Here's what it says. Peter said this, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Actually, Jesus said it, Peter, rather. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood have not been built unto you, son and bar Jonah, my father, which in heaven upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Right? He's talking about the right foundation. We need to build on the foundation. And as Christians, we're builders. That means it translates into building a good foundation. Um, and we're already there if we know Jesus Christ, our personal Savior. Um, and uh, Paul tells us this. There can be no other foundation but the ones laid by the apostles and the prophets, the one that Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. And so, are we willing to build our lives on the correct foundation? That's the first thing we have to do. Um, we should do it with the most holy faith, it tells us. Praying to the Holy Spirit, it tells us. These are the ways that we build on our foundation. And so, it says this, uh, Beloved, when I gave diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. That's in Jude. That's a very, the very third verse in Jude. Jude says, I wanted to write to you about our common faith, but then I was exhorted by the Spirit to write about something else. And he says this, to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. That's what he's saying. That is the foundation. Once you go back to that, and that's what we have to go to. What we realize now is that some 2,000 years later, the Christian, the, the idea of Christianity and the faith of the saints that were given to us has not budged one inch. When Jesus came, when he went, and he was coming again, that means it's important, according to the blueprint here, we're given in his word, is to pass it on. We're supposed to be builders. And we have the blueprint before us to do the job. Right here in the word of God, he's given us blueprint to pass the message on to people. It's not something that we can't figure out. Uh, you know, uh, if you gave me a blueprint to a big sky rise building, I couldn't figure it out. I looked at that thing and I'd be lost. But giving the word, to people around us about Jesus Christ is simple. He, his son died on the cross for our sins. If we accept him as our personal savior, we can be born again and have eternity and the hope for the rest of our lives. It's a simple message and any of us can do it. And he says here we're to pray to the Holy Ghost. That's the second thing, right? 
Um, when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we need to be immersed in the Spirit. And sometimes there's things that we want to pray about that we can't even utter or speak. And it tells us in the Bible that sometimes they're so deep that we just groan. We don't know how to articulate. We don't know how to pray about it. Because the point is, he's not talking about religion here. He's talking about a supernatural exercise. It means beyond natural. And in our, in our lives, there's things that are, on, that are natural, right? We were born in the natural sense. We were reborn in the spirit in a supernatural sense, right? You know, we have the supernatural book right here in front of us. These things are not normal. They're beyond nature. Uh, it tells us there was a supernatural birth, right? A virgin birth in the Bible. There's a God-man. That's supernatural. It tells us of supernatural life. That he lived and rebuked the wind and the sea. He raised the dead. The moon and the sun refused to show themselves. When, when he died upon the cross, three, day, three days later, there's a supernatural resurrection. In the upper room, there was 120 people, and the church was inaugurated with a supernatural movement. It was not a denomination. It was not a seminary. It was the Holy Spirit falling down from heaven upon all those people. And then Peter gets up. He talks, and 3,000 people come to Christ. That was a supernatural regeneration. To be born again, something supernatural has to be take, taken in place, takes in place that didn't take place naturally in us to be born again. Let me say that again. When we're born again, something supernaturally has to happen in us that didn't happen, happen in us naturally. The reason is, is because we don't naturally tend to be like Christ. That is not the way that we naturally are. How are we naturally? Well, I'll tell you, take a one-month-old a one -month baby, and we see the nature of humans, right? What does that baby want? Everything for him, right? He cries. He wants something right now. They're selfish, right? They don't think about anybody else around them. That's how we are naturally. You can see that in a newborn baby. The question we have today is, the world is unraveling all around us, right? And we have to ask, are we hitting a new paradigm? Or are we going to go back to normal? What is normal? What is normal going to be from here on out? And honestly, I don't know the answer. But I do know whatever, whatever it is, whatever happens, we're supposed to keep ourselves in the love of God. He says you do this first by building yourself up in the most holy faith. Do it by sitting in the word, praying, reading, allowing the word to work in your life and then you need to be praying about it. You and I, we need to be spending time in prayer with the Holy Spirit to lead us and to direct us and as we do that, we will develop a herd immunity. The more the healthy that the body is, the more the healthy a Pine Community Church will be. The better our church will be. And then he says that's the producing, the exercise of keeping ourselves in the love of God. That's what it does. We do all those things and in that exercise, we will keep ourselves in the love of God. And it not only means to do it once, but it means to do it continually. So in the presence, we need to do it, and we need to continue to do it. And it is done by building and praying. It means to watch over and care of a possession we already have. The possession we already have is Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We already possess the love of God. And yet, we live in His Spirit. We possess something, and yet we're covered by it. And he says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I kept my... I lost my, lost my place here. <laughs> I'll find it here. Um, and, it, and it says, as the Father... This is John 15. It says, as the Father hath loved me, so hath I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as you kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's what we're supposed to do, abide in his love. And that's what he's speaking of. And it should draw us to have an effect on others too. Because it causes us to continually uh, keep ourselves right where we should be, in the love of God. Um, it is not that his love is far away, it's all around us. And that's the great thing. 
And in also verse 21, he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we have to be expecting. What are we expecting? The return of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what we're expecting. It is an unwavering hope. And what we are talking about here is the rapture. Because Jesus already came to earth, right? He died on the cross. He did a supernatural ascension. And we are waiting for his return. And we should be expecting continually of that return. And that keeps us in our perspective of what's going on. Everything going on around us, if we can think about that, will put those things in perspective for us. So the result there is be building, be praying, and respecting his return. And if you are genuine in that, you will keep yourself in God's love. That is how he's asking us to live today. That is for you, that is for me. But what do we do with those that are making bad decisions in their life? Do we just blow them off? Those who are backsliding? Well, he tells us exactly what to do in verses 22 and 23. It says this, And some have compassion, making distinctions, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. And so this is Jude directly speaking to what do you do with people that are sinning in their lives? And this is for all of us, right? We all do it, right? The, the thing here is we don't know whether he's talking about three groups or two groups of people. But either way, he's talking about groups of people here. And first he says is have compassion. So we're to have compassion for those, right? Why should we have compassion for people that are sinning? Because we're sinners too, right? That's why we should have compassion. For those that fear or doubt, right? And then there's a third group, potentially, those that are in the fire. And then those that have the garments that are spotted. Together is a one group of truth which doesn't really matter because there's two things. We have to have compassion and care. If we have those two things, we will reach out to those people that are suffering or having a hard time or sinning because if we can have those. And it means in a present way, we must be compassionate continually to those that doubt, because sometimes people have doubt in their lives, right? And we need to come alongside them and bring compassion and care. Sometimes people are caught up in dispute. They get caught up with false teachers, people that are leading them off track. And this is the thing that we have to be leery in the church of, is false teachers leading people off track. What we have to do for those people is we have to come alongside them and we have to share the word of God. And we can't do that unless we're in God's love and in his word. We need to be abiding in the word, in God's love, so when we go to those people, we don't turn them away, but rather we bring them back. That's the thing we need to do. So we come to them in compassion. We come to them with the truth. Just like Jesus Christ is showing us, right? That's how he came to us. It says in verse 23, it talks about this fear. Your translation might say rescue. The idea is that when they're in this situation, we're supposed to rescue people. We're supposed to go get them and rescue them from the fire, right? If your child was about to walk in a, in a big fire, what would you do? You would reach and grab them out, right? My brother did that once. We were running around a ring of fire, and he thought that the easiest way to get catch me was go right to the fire. Yeah. He didn't burn his foot. But of course, my parents rescued him and then took him to the ER, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so what he's saying is, if people are going into the fire, we need to rescue them out. We don't want them to go there, right? Pulling them out. Um, he may be thinking of either a situation of Zachariah or Amos. Amos said this, I have, or I think I, think I should Zachariah said this, but either way, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were, as a fire, plucked out from the burning fire, and yet you have not returned to me, saying the Lord. And he's talking about pulling them away from sin, right? Sodom and Gomorrah were great places, right? There was nothing bad going on there. I was only filled with evil and bad things. So he's saying to them, I'm going to pull you out of that, right? And that's what he's telling us to do for fellow believers. When we see them going someplace they shouldn't, to come alongside and pull them out of that. That's what he's saying. Um, and when they're in trouble, to do the same thing. 
And then the final thing is he talks about this idea of the, of the spotted garment. And what that is that's representative of the sin in our lives. It makes the garment dirty, right? And this garment would have been something that would have been underneath the clothes that they wore over the top. It would have been against their body. And what he's saying is that, that he doesn't like that defilement in our lives. Because what it represents is the stage represents sin in our lives. Right? And we all have those, right? And he says God doesn't like those things in our lives. And, uh, you know, one of the things, I would say this, one of the things, the hugest mistake we make in the church today, when we see people living in adultery, or taking drugs, or whatever they're doing that makes their life, that they're living in sin, we feel the need to snuggle up to them and make them feel warm before we say anything, right? Because we think if we're nice, that we're gonna, we're gonna change them. We'll get a chance to say what we wanna say. The world is falling apart all around us. And here's what we know. People that aren't saved are going to hell. That's where they're going. And just being nice all the time and trying to make them feel good is not necessarily gonna save them. We have to give them honest truth if we want to win their mortal souls. That's the point. We're supposed to be light and salt under the world. And it says here that you're supposed to be repulsed by the garment that was stained. That doesn't mean that you're repulsed by to the sinners, right? It means you hate their sin, but you love the sinner. That is the point. Hate what they're doing that is sin. Make sure that they understand that you hate it, but love the sinner. That is the result of this passage. When there's conflict, when there's trouble, have compassion. Go into the fire to rescue them. And finally, those that are living in sin and those that continue to do so hate the thing that they're doing and then keep, keep loving them. He goes on in verse 24 and 25 and he gives us this great doxology after he gives us this directive. And this really is a great doxology. Let's read it. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful doxologies in the Bible. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to the presence you faultless before the presence of his holy glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now this is what we're supposed to do. Before he's talking about what we're not supposed to do, right? But God is not foolish enough to recognize that just to give us this command and say do it on your own. He doesn't do that. He gives us the tools to do it. He gives us the Holy Spirit, right? He infuses us with the ability to fulfill these things. Um, because in and of ourselves, we can't do it. Um, he says he's able to keep us from stumbling. Who is able to keep us from stumbling? God. That's what it says. Now to him, him is God. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is, to keep, is able to keep us from stumbling. And then he says, in, and to present you faultless. Why would he want to present you faultless? He wants to present you faultless before his, his father, right? God, that's who he's presenting his faultless to. And that's what he's going to do at the end of time, right? After, after he comes back, the judgment set, he's going to present us before his father. And he's going to say, he's one of mine. You know what, that, you know what we look like to... God, when, when Jesus says that, we looked blameless and holy as Christ, as Jesus Christ. And that blows me away. And that should blow you away too. We are present that way because of our redemption, and we will be that way on the day that we're judged. And on that day, we no longer have this sinful nature in our lives. Because right now, we have a sinful nature, right? And we don't always do a good job controlling it. But when we get to heaven, that sinful nature is going to go away. It's going to be amazing. You know, today, sometimes we think we understand what eyeballs are meant for, right? But when we get to heaven, we're going to see some of the most beautiful things we've ever seen. And we'll truly understand what our eyeballs are, eyeballs are meant for. When we get to heaven, we're really going to know what ears are for, right? Because we're going to hear the most beautiful singing. When we get to heaven, we're going to know what's, what, the, what, the, what the sense of smell really is for because it's going to be the sweetest aroma we ever smelled. The other thing is, when we get to heaven, 
it's going to be the perfect temperature, and my wife's no longer going to be able to control the temperature gauge. <laughs> That's what we were meant for. That's what we were meant for. <laughs> he will bring us home faultless, just like Enoch. He finishes with this in verse 25. The only wise Savior to our God and Savior, who alone is wise. He was saying this of his older brother. He didn't say my older brother. He was saying his Lord and Savior. He recognized that fact. I'm assuming that he was in that room with that 120 when he came to that realization. And he describes four very important attributes here. He talks about what the Lord and Savior is like. And the first thing he says is, he says glory, right? To the, be glory and majesty. The glory is shining forth of all his attributes. That's what we'll see someday. The second thing he says about his, the Lord and Savior is his majesty. Royal dignity. He's the king. He's our Lord and Savior. Dominion. Infinite control. He has infinite control over this world, regardless of what's going on today, regardless how things seem they're out of control. God is in control. He has infinite power, and He's infinitely in control, no matter what we see, or if we feel like things are out of control so bad that nothing can be fixed. Our Lord and Savior can fix everything. And He has the power. Azusa, that is the word for it. He is the creator, and He has a right to rule over everything that he's created. And he will do that. And he is doing that. And then he finishes with now and forever. And I'm sure glad he is able to do that now and forever. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the fact that you are our Lord and Savior, Lord. That you have control of this whole world, even when it seems like it's out of control, Lord that you have control in our lives, that you love us enough to allow your son to come down and die upon the cross for our sins, a price we couldn't pay, but only through your son, the perfect substitute for our sin, Lord, and I thank you for that. I ask, as we go out into this community, to our loved ones and those around us, and the opportunities at our work, that we would share that love by the way that we live, by the way that we treat people, by the way that we talk to people, and by the way that we share about your Son, Jesus Christ, that they will know the same hope we have for our life, Lord. That, that, this, place, that this planet may be out of control, but there is an eternity that we get to go to someday, in heaven with you forever, in the most wonderful place where, where there is no pain, where there is no sadness, but there is joy, there is the wonderful time of fellowship and to be with you. And so I ask that we could pass that on to those brothers. In your name, amen. amen.